Welcome back to The Short Game. This is where we talk about short video games, the kind of thing that you can pick up and complete in an evening or a weekend, games that respect your time. I'm your host, Reagan Kelly, and I am joined this week by all of my awesome co-hosts, starting on the left. Internet left. Left of the Skype window. Moving from east to west across the country. <laughs> starting with you, Laura. How are you doing today, Laura? I'm doing terrific. Uh, and Shane Kelly, my actual twin brother. How are you doing, Shane? I am feeling great. Haven't had to put on pants today. That is that is a comfort, isn't it? Yes, it is a great comfort. And uh, and Nate, how are you doing today? Super spooked. Ooh, I am also spooked because this week we're talking about Until Dawn, um, which is a horror game for the PlayStation 4. It's an exclusive. So Until Dawn is something that's come up on this show a few times, and uh, we've actually had some folks reach out to us and ask uh, when or if we were going to cover it. We probably would have covered it sooner, except that the fact that it is a really weird game uh, in terms of just, well, how it was produced and released. I mean, Until Dawn is a PlayStation 4 exclusive. It's a 10-ish hour game that is released at full retail price on a disc for the PlayStation 4. I mean, also downloadable, but that's a that's an unusual thing in and of itself. Like, we don't do a lot of full retail releases here, let alone... Uh, exclusives to a particular console. When this came out, uh, not all of our uh, short game co-hosts had PlayStation 4s, but now that we all do, and the price on the game came down a little bit to make it a little less crazy for us to all four of us buy a $60 game all at once. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's we have ethics in our game journalism. We don't take handouts from the game companies. <laughs> we, uh, we buy our titles that's full retail right. price. When they give us handouts. I was going to say, hold on. <laughs> that's not when a title. When people give us handouts, we willingly take them. If you'd like to hand us out something, reach out to us at <laughs> underscore short game. Yep. <laughs> Guaranteed positive reviews. <laughs> <laughs> Without a doubt. Yeah, this game, uh, this game was something that I was really looking forward to. Uh, I read a couple of reviews, or sort of advanced previews, rather, before it came out. And so I pre-ordered it, because I knew it would be something that I would enjoy. We had just come off of, uh, of Life is Strange, and I'd been enjoying playing that. I actually don't think it was entirely out yet, but I think we were, like, the second or third episode of it had just come out, and I was, you know, playing a lot of this sort of thing on the PlayStation 4 at the time. Um, and uh, I happen to be really into horror movies, my wife happens to be really, really into horror movies. and uh, I can vouch for that. She's obsessed. Yeah, really obsessed. And so we were interested in playing it just because she thought she would find it interesting to kind of watch this game, even though she didn't really play it much herself because the quick time events weren't really her thing. And that's understandable. We'll talk about the quick time events in a little bit. Um, oh, yes, we will. Yeah. So it's a 10-ish hour, incredibly gorgeous PlayStation 4 exclusive horror movie of a game you're controlling all of the characters all the teens so, so many teen. teens <laughs> um how many teens eight eight right? teens Se- yeah or seven um and also in full on horror movie trope uh one of a billion that it hits it's a bunch of teens that look like they're in their yes. 30s <laughs> and all played by really competent actors so like this has a, a few uh, not to go over the whole list or anything, but you know, you'll you'll see some recognizable faces, incredibly uh, well digitized into you know three D models. So lots of uh, lots of good acting f- for a horror movie slash game. Yeah, uh, what's the um, the guy from Mr. Robot? What's his name? Um, he's in it, and I knew that he was a voice. Rami in it. Ismail. Yeah, yeah. That's it. I knew he was a voice in the game. I was not expecting him to be a face in the game as well. Like these characters are modeled after like the voices that played them. Um, and he is a very distinctly looking person. And it was a pretty big shock. I was like, Oh, he's actually just kind of in this game. Yep. Like one of my favorite moments in the game was when I realized that, you know, when you're playing as these re- very recognizable actors, if you pause, you get this sort of, or if you just sort of go idle for a moment, it zooms in on their face and your right stick just sort of puppeteers their eyeballs and their emotions, and you just sort of like waggle your control <laughs> sticks, and you can control their. Uh, you could just sort of create little scenes of your own by by <laughs> doing your own voice. It has the most incredibly detailed facial models of 
any game I've played, uh, at least on the PlayStation 4, and probably of any game, I mean, incredibly detailed facial models. Uh, what about the Wonderful. Mario face at the beginning of Mario 64? Uh, <laughs> I will say it's pretty motivating to keep the actors you like alive because I played this game like, the day after Grease Live aired, and one of the actors was just the most charming like singer, dancer on that show, and he has a little varsity jacket on during the number, and then he shows up as Matt in this with a varsity letter jacket, and I was like, oh man, <laughs> I can't kill duty. Oh no. No, save duty. <laughs> Let me guess. You were unsuccessful at saving duty. I did save duty. Oh, did you really? He no. survived. Wow, Sorry. he's a tricky one to he's, he's a tricky a one hard. to keep alive. I think it was accidental. And so as we mentioned there, you you're res- you're responsible for keeping all of these characters alive. And in typical horror movie fashion, uh dangerous things happen all the time. And it's it, there's lots of little moments uh, where you have to either react quickly or make choices. You have to hit triangle or sometimes square. <laughs> yes, you have to Shane, sometimes hit correct. the circle button. Sometimes you have to hold the right stick while you hit R2 a few times. <laughs> sometimes you use the touchpad button. Uh, you navigate with a stick on your controller. Sometimes you waggle that stick yes, around. Yes, Shane, that does describe a video game. Um, <laughs> and, and actually, <laughs> interestingly enough... Um, this is a game that kind of didn't begin with almost any of those as the key gameplay mechanics. Good transition there, Reagan. Uh, this is a this is a game that actually began its life as so the, the developer is Supermassive Games, who I had never heard of, and odds are you probably hadn't heard of them before this game either, because they're a relatively small time, I would say, uh, developer in England, uh, and until now, their biggest games they're almost all like PlayStation exclusives and almost all of their games have been either ports or things like uh, HD like they did a PlayStation 3 HD remake of Killzone um or they did the PlayStation Vita version of Little Big Planet or actually no I'm wrong I'm just double checking this they did some downloadable content for the PlayStation Vita version of Little Big Planet like they they don't have a lot of big name games under their belt and a lot of the games that they have done that were like theirs and theirs alone are things like walking with dinosaurs for the PlayStation three. So this is their first really big name game. I think it's their first thing at all with original IP. Um, and they got started with it initially planning for it to be a PlayStation move game. So I don't know if you remember the PlayStation move. That's those horrible little motion controllers. Nobody remembers the PlayStation move. That (laughs) explains why they offered motion controllers, which I tried for about a minute and a half and was like, Nope, 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 Nope. Yep, they really, really want you to use motion control in this game. So originally the game was going to play out with you using the PlayStation Move controllers to do things like shine a flashlight around. Or, you know, there's tons of little moments in this game where you pick up an object and you have to like turn it over in your hands. You'd have been doing that. Um, Things like when you have to unlock a lock and the game asks you to do like a basically a button combo in order to unlock a lock. All of that would have been uh, motion control in the original conception of this game. I'm not sure that would have improved it, but, you know. (laughs) Yeah, you know, I'm not totally sure that it would have either. And nobody bought those PlayStation Move controllers because nobody really wanted to play games with them. I mean, that's... Did you guys even try the motion control for a second? I never... You actually have to physically, like, move your entire controller horizontal or vertical to make those objects rotate, and so I turned it back off. Yeah, I did not consider it for more than three seconds. <laughs> yeah, it was bad. Yeah, th- this game started with a totally different idea. It was in developed for development for a very long time. It eventually reemerged for the PlayStation 4, but you, it's, you still see some of that weird cruft of its original ideas kind of hanging on. Um, and I think that accounts for some of the weirder or more fiddly um, aspects of this game. But um, if you press through that, I think it tells a really good horror movie story. And whether you think this game has a good story will really depend on whether you like horror movies. You know, if you like horror movies, this is a game that is basically a playable horror movie. And if you don't like horror movies, you probably won't find much to like here. I don't like horror movies because I find them most of the time to be like boring or I just can't get into it. Not saying that they're bad, but I just something I've never been able to get into. I enjoyed this game. It took <laughs> okay. me a while. It was uh, the first two hours or so of it, I really, maybe even more, three hours or so, I was not super into this game. By the end of it, when I was done, uh, I found that I really actually did enjoy this game a lot. 
Because I kind of went in not not thinking I would like this game because of things like that. But um, I did. I did enjoy it. One of the weirder things about if you're if you like some horror movies but not all of them, this is very much all of the horror movies in one. So, oh yeah, if you're like I, you know, I just like a lot of supernatural or psychological horror movies. I don't necessarily like some of the other subgenres. So it was kind of like, oh, I see where these thirteen ho- different horror movie genres were stuck in at different spots. Cool. I like two of those. <laughs> yeah, I think the only one that I didn't see in there was Paranormal Romance. Like, no, one was, <laughs> no one was sleeping with any of the monsters here. Unfortunately, uh, that would have been a very see. interesting, uh, interesting twist. But yeah, the, the, it, every single horror movie trope, and we'll talk more about that after the spoiler break. Because if we were to list off every single horror movie trope uh, that we can think of, we would basically be spoiling uh, some of the joy of this game. The whole, the whole thing. Yes. So uh, this is a game where it, I think, clearly is a descendant of the Telltale game innovation, which is to say it's a choose-your-own-adventure plus a little bit of uh, gamey navigation and object interaction, right? Yeah, I think that you could say that it kind of takes a lot of influence from Telltale and a lot of influence from things like Quantic Dreams games like uh, Heavy Rain. Yeah, I I haven't played Heavy Rain. I would also say a game that we did for the show that I felt had, this is a bit of a stretch, but the Laura Croft game, um, in that it was long stretches of quick time events to ultimately decide like the direction you took um, action-wise. I was having flashbacks to Ori, where I couldn't hit the buttons fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> Except in Ori, I just restarted the level, and in here, someone died. So Yeah, and those are really unre- irreversible. Like, having played this very shortly after I played um, uh, um, Life is Strange, I really wished for that rewind power in a lot of these situations. I know, right? It's also, uh, it's also like a 3D adventure game. And so if you go back to things like Grim Fandango, Grim Fandango has you walking around these 3D spaces with fixed camera angles. This does that too. And uh, there are times when that works and there are times when that really doesn't. You know, sometimes having a fixed camera angle, you know, Resident Evil kind of does the same thing where, you know, you'll have a fixed camera angle and that means you can't see what's on the other side of that door that you're going to have to walk through until you've walked through it. And that can build a lot of tension. It does give you, these really great moments where like you know i think to horror as a genre like camera angle and like what you can see and what's obscured is really important and so for this game i do feel like that really worked there's moments where like you round a corner and you're in a hallway and there's like uh like a doctor's skeleton model in the hallway and so like two-thirds of your screen is now just spooky skeleton (laughs) (laughs) and you know, like it's it's good stuff. I, like I, I think that part works. Usually, usually that's that didn't get in the way for me. It gives you this cool observer effect, and they do a lot of it when people are outside. You might suddenly get a camera shot through bushes. Yeah, they they pay a lot of attention to like horror movie style cinematography. So Reagan, you said like the director of this was like a big name in horror, somebody that your wife actually recognized. Oh, actually, he's the writer. Um, so the the director of the game is you know uh, somebody from Supermassive Games, and I I don't know his name. Um, but the, the lead writer was Larry Fessenden. Um, I, I hadn't really heard of him, but, but we were playing through this. Larry Fessenden is both a horror writer and director and also actor. And he, in, in most of his, his movies, he's all three. And, um, he's, he's like a really weird looking guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's just strange and unsettling looking. (laughs) Whoa. And sorry, Larry Shots Fessenden. Fought. Shots fired. <laughs> and, well, I think that's you know that's that's a good quality in horror horror actors. Uh, he's just unsettling looking, and so yeah, he plays a character who appears about halfway through the game, um, and we won't talk about who that is until after the spoiler break, I suppose. And when he appears, um, you know, my wife was like, "Oh, that's Larry Fessenden," and then we looked it up, 
And uh, uh, again, not to, to spoil some things, but um, he's he wrote and directed some horror movies that you can very clearly see why his work appealed to the people who are making this game, uh, because they share some thematic and even uh, even plot elements. So don't look it up if you don't want to be spoiled. That's probably not that big of a spoiler. He has an enormous uh, filmography, so you could look that up and find <laughs> basically every uh, every horror. A lot of a lot of crap horror that you'll find on Netflix, plus a few really interesting movies. Uh, lest we give you the impression that this is a game that is nothing but quick time events. Um, it is a game where you're presented over and over again with choices, and it does a really good job of making those choices meaningful. And those choices happen in a lot of different ways physically for you on screen. It, it, that can be a choice between like walking left and right in a hallway, but it could also be uh, choices in dialogue where you're choosing between a couple of different things to say, or whether you choose to... Uh, run away from some sort of attacker in a fast way or a safe way. You know, that's one that comes up a few times. Do you want to go the fast route or the safe route? Um, and so all of that leads to choices where ultimately you have to choose, um, if you haven't played your cards right, whether to save the happy teen or the sullen teen or the uh, the friendly teen or the bitchy teen. Yeah. <laughs> choices might have made them happy sullen or bitchy so true yeah yes and the game has a saving mechanic or saving system that really enforces the feeling of uncertainty and unease that you have you know there's no like save slots on this game you can't roll back to a previous save if you make a mistake or miss a quick time event or you know accidentally allow a character to be killed if a character is killed and you want to go back you have to start the entire chapter over uh, and that can be quite a quite a bit of time uh, and and it also auto saves everything that you do so you really have to be ready to react at all times and you have to kind of commit to your choices once you've made them yeah and don't start the episode over or the chapter over that's no, lame no don't yeah that that, yeah. that would be lame it, it, if you do that, you're lame. And I'm sorry if any of you guys did that, because that's lame. <laughs> I didn't do that. That would be lame. Yeah, exactly. Um, didn't even know you could do that. I didn't know someone could be that lame. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm actually doing a second playthrough right now, and I have done that a little bit, because I have... Uh, oh, here's the part where Reagan describes he's lame. How yep, lame, I'm how lame. lame Reagan is, yeah. Well, uh, I've, been, I've been trying to go through a second time and try to have a playthrough where everybody lives, and that is yeah, possible. That's different. It that's is different. possible to get through this, uh, this horror game full of death, and just make sure that everybody lives. But man, you missed that square button one time. Yeah. But they don't make the any most of these choices are not moral choices. It's not like you're choosing between one that's like be a terrible person or be a wonderful caring human being. It's not like a you know, some choices in some other games have felt like, oh, the game wants me to choose this. They try really hard to make you know, some of the dialogue choices, yes, you can decide if you're going to be cruel or nice, but a lot of the meaningful choices are really neutral. And I very much appreciated that because even if you've watched a million horror movies, you might not know in this circumstance whether you should investigate the noise or keep walking. Oh, man. And I know exactly the choice that you're talking about right now, too. <laughs> and that one was the worst. <laughs> I thought it was... Super obvious, which is the right one. <laughs> it did to me too, but apparently, I well, I thought it was trying to psych me out. We'll talk about that one in a minute. <laughs> so you're bringing up the idea of the butterfly effect, yeah. which is a mechanic in the game. Starring they have Ashton a whole Kutcher. a whole screen dedicated to it, where certain choices, and you don't know which choices these are until after you've made them, uh, trigger what they describe as butterfly effects. And there's there's a menu you can go into and see what your choice was and what the result was of that choice. And usually several results that play out across the rest of the game. So if you make a choice, uh, then it'll tell you that that has an effect and you'll see a new entry on your butterfly effect screen. Um, and then as the game progresses, you'll see the ripples of that effect and new 
uh, repercussions to that effect will appear on the butterfly effect menu so that you can go back in and look at all of your key choices and page through and see, well, because of this, this happened. And then because of that, this other thing happened and so on. Yeah. They say that, um, the developers of this game have said that there are, because of this like route, um, or this, this mechanic, there are essentially thousands of different like ways that this game could be played through. Obviously we're talking very subtle differences among those thousands, but like the chance that you played through and had the exact same game as it, you know as anyone else is pretty pretty unlikely even though the major outcomes and the major changes are often decided by just a couple choices um there's so many little divergent paths that this game can definitely um be played through multiple times the plot is fairly linear um but uh, any one of the characters can either be alive or dead by the end and that happens for so many different kinds of reasons. So sometimes that the uh, you know a character's death might be due to something like a missed uh, quick time event, but other times it might be some sort of fairly innocuous seeming choice you made uh, has a really surprising sort of ripple effect that causes the situation to be just different enough that something major happens a little way down the line. Um, lots of different ways that these characters can meet their fate. Yeah, one that that came up for me, and this I hope I, I'll try not to spoil anything as I say this, but one of the choices, uh, basically, the the effect of that choice is one of the characters may or may not get a tiny scratch on their a little scratch on their face, and then later on they're trying to hide, and that scratch has a little blood drip that could either give their position away or if they haven't been scratched, it doesn't. So it's that kind of little butterfly effect type you know ripples of of causality that go throughout the rest of the game i thought that was really interesting and the fact that they let you keep track of what those choices were and you know see what the effects are as they unfold explicitly is pretty nice This game is divided up into chapters, and in that way it really does sort of feel a bit like a Telltale game, but also not so much, because the chapters are shorter than you'd find in that sort of game. Each chapter is about an hour long, and there are ten of them, uh, and between each chapter it would do a couple of kind of interesting things. At the end of each chapter, uh, you'd have a scene between an unseen uh, sort of first-person character, so presumably you, uh, sitting in a psychiatrist's office and speaking to this psychiatrist who is absolutely creepy as hell. Um, it's Peter Stormer. Yeah, it's a it's a real guy who's creepy. Yeah, yeah. No, he's he's a super <laughs> creepy actor, and I recognize him, but I didn't know his name. Um, and so his performance is fantastic. And in between each episode, he'll have a sort of a psychiatric visit with you and ask you questions about your your interaction with the game. So he'll ask you, like, do you think you're uh, a loyal person? Do you think that you're displaying loyalty through the way that you're playing? And, you know, he, when you respond to him, he'll he'll bring those things that you say in the psychiatric sessions up again in, in the future. Um, and sometimes it's just verbal, but other times he'll give you a book of, uh, of drawings and ask you what your reaction is to them. Or at one point, he asks you to rank all of the different characters in terms of how much you like them. So my absolute favorite part was that he gave you, he gave you a variety of spooky things. That was my favorite too. <laughs> and he asked, you, he asked you which was most scary. And I was like, oh, I have to be honest, but it's also going to scare me more. I know. I, know. I, I ranked clowns pretty high, and then I kept seeing clowns come up in the game. So I'm not sure if me saying what was more scary, like that I was more scared of clowns than oh, spiders. Oh, I'm sure it did. But mm -hmm. that spiders were scarier than snakes. Like, was the reason that there was like a... Like a, like a scarecrow with a clown mask that like jump scared me later, but, but I'm pretty sure it is. There was a big old like wolf, in mine, and I and I picked it and I was like, ah, you're scared of dogs, and I was like, no, I'm not. I am not scared of dogs. <laughs> the wolves. <laughs> I'm scared of this wolf. Yeah, I thought that whole sequence, all of the sequences with the doctor, were really well acted. 
Um, but also I thought they were really interestingly integrated. At first you don't know how they relate to the rest of the game and it slowly becomes obvious of how it does relate. And I thought that was really good, but also they become slowly more surreal at the, at the start, they're just a psychiatrist visit. And then, you know, the third or fourth psychiatrist visit, things are starting to get pretty spooky in that psychiatrist office. (laughs) Oh yes. Um, yeah, I, I was getting some, uh, uh, cabin in the woods uh, vibes, kind of like a dark architect of the whole thing. And so meta, like <laughs> he's saying, he's actually saying things like, "So you have chosen to play this game? Mm-hmm. That is not a good idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this yeah. game you're playing is—is uh, is it working out for you?" Okay, he he does not have he's that not accent. That Russian. <laughs> <laughs> he's just he's just a, he's just a really spooky. He's got a guy. magnificent accent that he's, I could never yeah. repeat. Incredibly, incredibly well uh, voice acted, and and the facial animations are so well done. So anyway, that part is really really good. And then after each of those, when you begin e- the next chapter, it does a last time on, very typical of like your TV show type thing. And I was surprised that they did those. They do them every single time, even if you're playing multiple chapters in a session. Um, And they are a little helpful if you're coming back to it after a while, which is nice. I tended to play like two chapters per sitting. Um, So I played it over a series of about five nights. Yeah, I think those are great. I I think inviting your player to like take a step back and like come back to this later, especially on something like this where, you know, it's it's a – you know, it's an essentially in a TV format, you know, like having having that recap was really helpful to me because I knew where I could take a break mm-hmm. uh, and have it like fit with the beats of the story. And I knew I could put it away for a while and not come back and forget like which teen is which. You know, this game has in typical horror fashion, like a billion twists and turns. You know, if you were to skip from. If you were to play the yeah. first chapter and then play like the eighth chapter, it's like an entirely different universe it's complicated. that you're that you're playing in. And what they do is uh, before each chapter, they do the thing where like the pull the you know the previously on is very selective to what you'll be encountering in that chapter you're about to play. So like you might not remember this one little reference from the first chapter, um, but fortunately they kind of they put that specific moment in the previously on, so you're kind of reminded. It's very much like the previous long Game of Thrones where they'll show a character that you haven't seen in four seasons. And you're like, oh, <laughs> interesting. That's what I got a little bit of that. You might see a character you haven't seen in a while and you're like, hmm, mm-hmm. okay. Thanks. Guess who's coming back this week? So it would be kind of a fun way to play this game would be to play like one episode a week. I, I almost kind of wonder why they didn't release it uh, over a series of weeks, you know, uh, each it really it as downloadable, like uh, episodic content, kind of like uh, Life is Strange or the Telltale stuff. Uh, I, I suppose I kind of see why in that being like a PlayStation 4 exclusive and being a, um, you know, the, the way that the game was developed uh, and promoted, I think that maybe that might have been a consideration. Also, the fact that the chapters are relatively short and that you know, usually if you have a, a game like this where you're jumping between characters, often characters would disappear for a while. So if I was coming back to like, if I played chapter five um, several weeks or months after I played chapter one, it might have been coming back to characters that I hadn't seen in a while and wouldn't really remember. So it does also make the butterfly effect stronger if you can remember the actions you took when you move forward. So playing once a week makes sense, but I wouldn't go that much farther than that. Yeah, and I'm I like episodic for sure, but I'm also cool with like not episodic. You know, like if Life is Strange would have just been released as like all five parts, and I could just sit and play them all right out of the gates, I would have been happy with that too. I like that like Life is Strange they were developing it and taking feedback as they move forward. Like I see that as a benefit of episodic, but I don't. I I don't really need it, you know? Like, I don't think it would have made this game any better to only get to play it once a week. And we're about to go to our spoiler break. Does anybody have anything uh, that you want to say about the the story or gameplay before we get into talking about the specifics of the spooky teens and horror tropes that uh, made this game what it was? 
Well, just that I am loving this game and I'm definitely going to want to continue playing it, but I didn't finish it in time. So I really want to talk about it with you guys, but I uh, I can't because you guys are going to spoil all the spooks for me. Yeah. <laughs> I'll also say that uh, it is intense. Even if you're just uh, wandering around in the dark, you have no idea what's going to happen next. So um, it is a game that I was not always in the mood for. And but when I was, it was exactly what I wanted to do. Oh man, I, I'm glad you brought that up. I uh, I was playing. I played this all in a weekend. Um, I I actually this game is still on Redbox. I had never done Redbox before, but I got this game at Seven Eleven, and I returned it. I got it on Friday, and I returned it on Monday, and it cost me nine dollars. So that's pretty tight because it's like sixty dollars new. Um, but anyway, I also in the middle of this. Um, I know I talk about this game a lot, but I hadn't actually played it in a long time. Uh, I started playing Faster Than Light again. Oh. And, and, I, and again, I, I, I know, yeah, put another check mark on that box. Um, but I actually haven't really played that game in a long time. And I feel like it was a, like a reaction, like a gut react. Like this game was so stressful and so intense. I was like, I, I need to play. And that's actually part of why we did Super Hot, because it's like, I need to do a game that's fun right now like until dawn is is a kind of fun but it's the kind of fun where you're just like i'm holding the controller really tight and staring at the screen in like because the quick time events like the the quick time event button is rapidly changing its location on the screen and i have a hard time noticing those so i'm like hyper focused on the screen hyper focused on my hand like and i know it's just hitting triangle or just hitting square but like people's lives are at stake here, man. And, <laughs> and like, it's just like the game you get done and you're just like, oh. and the best thing you can do for yourself is make an environment to love this game because finishing the game at 2 AM in at uh, alone in the apartment that I mm-hmm. usually share with another person with it snowing outside and it being dark was like, was the best decision I've made. Mm. Oh it yeah. Freaked me out. It destroyed yeah. my sleep, but it was, the right decision. I finished it on late at night too, and when I was done, I just like walked around my house for like fifteen minutes. Also, very much regretting a decision that I <laughs> yeah. made. But you we'll, do really uh, have to be in the right mood for it. You're <laughs> right, and and setting the mood is kind of important. Probably, uh, if you if you have a special way that you like to watch movies, I would go with that rather than however you normally play games. Like I would treat this like sitting down to watch a horror. Yeah, movie. no, I, I would totally agree with you on that. This is a movie. This is not really a game. This is a interactive movie in the in the style that when people first saw video games and they were like, oh, we can make interactive movies. This is the kind of thing that they were thinking about. And it finally has it finally here, guys. And uh, yeah, just, it's 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 going to get it's going to get you scared. And it's just enjoy your future of spookiness, Shane. I will. One uh, we've had some little complaints about the the game. And, and one last one that I want to mention before we go to spoiler break um, is that you can't skip anything. And that that you that makes perfect sense when you're playing through the first time, right? You know, you don't want to skip anything. There's dialogue and stuff. You can't skip the dialogue. You can't fast forward through the dialogue. You can't skip any uh, walking around, anything like that. You can't run. When you're doing the walking, there's no run button. Yeah, the, the walking speed is all pretty slow. I'm playing through it a second time right now, and I really wish I could skip the dialogue because I'm trying to do a perfect playthrough where I survive every, you know, all the characters survive and also I... Um, I find all of the secrets. I don't usually do that with games like this, but I I, I got this. Ga- I like this game enough that I decided I wanted to to you know give it another playthrough and do all of the stuff. And I've got all of the secrets now, or at least I'm pretty sure I've got all of them. But there's a lot of points in this game where like there's a lot of choices, but the the really meaningful ones that have a huge effect on whether people survive or don't are pretty far apart. Um, so playing through the game from beginning to end again, trying to keep all the characters alive has actually proven a little bit tedious. I would say that for most people, unless you're really, really into this specific style of game, you're probably not going to want to play it twice. And I think they could have made that. Yeah, maybe. And they, they probably could have made it a lot better for this sort of replayability if they'd just given me some kind of fast forward, like, please let me skip through this dialogue that I've already heard. Um, but they don't. So, you know, be warned. 
All right, and I guess that means it's time for the spoiler break and time for Shane to break with tradition and break with the podcast. And uh, those are the breaks. Those are the, the breaks. breaks. Sorry, Shane, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the game and try to keep those teens alive. I will do my best, but there, some of them are already dead. <laughs> <laughs> my condolences. It and listeners, if you, uh, if you uh, don't want spoilers, now would also be the time to take a break because this is it, your spoiler break. So I think we should start this spoiler side discussion um, trying to come up with horror movie tropes that um, were maybe not in this game, or at least let's go through the horror tropes that were in this game. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Every single possible conceivable horror movie trope makes an appearance here. I mean, and actually that's, that's an achievement all by itself. If this had been made just as a horror movie, I would have like, I would have looked at it and thought, wow, that was a grab bag. And yet it, it kind of worked. Like if you were going to make a 10 hour long horror movie, um, of course you're going to throw everything in and they really throw everything in here. I mean, including like, there's a part where you are in a girl's, you know, you're in Hannah, one of the, the dead girl's bedroom and you lift up, you know, Oh, it's a little ballerina in a, in one of those little spinning ballerinas in a music box. I was like, no one owns those except in horror movies. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just a tiny thing they threw in just just to be in a horror movie. And I mm. adored that stuff. There's Ouija board, you know, um, mistaken identities. Um, spooky ghosts in a spooky basement. There's jokesters. Lots of jokesters. Sometimes the pranks go bad. I mean, first off, I mean, this is about a bunch of teens in a cabin in the woods. I mean, we didn't mention that. If we didn't mention that at the start, like, this is literally the most classic horror scenario. Let's all go up to the creepy cabin. That's completely cut off from society. On that note, why did they all agree to get there at, like, 11 p.m.? <laughs> they had to ditch the parents, yo. Yeah. What decision-making is that? It's so late that the gates are locked and they have to climb over them. It's like, meet at noon or something. Like, right. it's so strange that they all get there so late at night. And then they find out, of course, that the cabin is on Indian land. <laughs> yeah. Another and oh, and and there's a escaped uh, mental patient on the loose, and like literally every possible horror movie trope gets thrown and in here. And they just want a bone. Oh, those man. teens oh, yeah. just Everybody want a bone. Everybody wants the bone or drink um, or smoke pot. Um, yeah, not just an escaped mental um, patient, but a closed down um, mental institution. That oh, yeah. you get to, yeah, yeah, that you get to kind of explore around in. Not to mention the the twist nor, near the end, where you know, it, well, I'd say about the first half of the game, we think that the uh, we think it's all like you know a killer on the loose kind of thing, and that seemed cool. And then the twist about halfway through the game actually really surprised me when it takes the turn towards actually, did you know there's when to go on this mountain? I was like, what? <laughs> Well, what? <laughs> they, there are three different bad guys. Yeah. There are, yeah. Well, and one of them's not even really a bad guy, um, but you think he is. Like, there's a twist where a bad guy turns out to be a friend. There's another twist where a bad guy turns out to be a spooky old man, and then you find out that there's monsters. Mm-hmm. And you kind of had an idea that there was monsters right from the beginning, though, because when you are playing as um, Hannah and the other sister, Beth. Beth, you're clearly being chased down by something that can move really, really fast and lives in the woods. You know, so like I kind of had an idea that there was a monster from the beginning. Yeah, and it's very unclear. Like, for example, when Jess gets like hauled out the window, you think, oh, man, some kind of creepy beast got her. But then when you get there, uh, all you see is the old guy. And you think to yourself, the old guy couldn't have done that. or did Well, he? and... They they threw the cell phone through the window, which is like a calculated thing, mm-hmm. you know, like that made me at that point, I, I still thought it was the dude because like, would a monster like know to throw a cell phone through a window and yeah. like, and like as a, 
as a tactic. Yeah, and I'd just been watching the BBC version of And Then There Were None, which is basically, let's invite everyone to all these murderers to a murder island. So I was very suspicious at the beginning when the the chill opening where um, Sam is watching the YouTube invite, because that's how kids apparently invite people to their cabins now. Um, (laughs) The video of Josh being like, let's make some memories we'll never forget. And I was like... Hmm. Something's oh, wrong see, there. Uh, I uh, I did not. Yeah, I did not see that coming. They got yeah. me with Josh. I, I actually I, I felt pretty good about my suspicions of most of the stuff. I did not see uh, the Josh twist coming. But partially because I didn't know the length of this game, I kept thinking that things were going to ha- like Josh and Sam go down to the basement to turn on the hot water so you can take a bath. I feel you, Sam. And. <laughs> He is just kind of chill in the basement with her. And I was like, oh, if he was a bad guy, he probably would have tried to kill her right now. And then, like, five minutes later, I was like, oh, or was that the scene where they tell me that the bad guy is not the bad guy? <laughs> I, I really I really think that this is the strength of the game is that is just it's a it's a well done horror movie story. And it's it's clear that they went out and got a serious horror movie director. I mean, we're not talking about like fine art here or anything. He directed the 2001 film Wendigo, for example. Har har. Um, mm-hmm. He's, he's you know, he's got a shtick then, I guess. But he's, um, he knows how to write a horror movie story. And this is a really decent horror movie story. And the, the characters are all pretty well done for horror movie characters. You know, um, the, the, the sort of lead character, I guess, is uh, Hayden uh, Panettiere. Sam, and she's kind of bland uh, because she's kind of just set up as like the survivor girl. But everybody else, like Mike and Jess and so on, like they all were at least interesting enough where I was like, I was into. They deserve to live. Yeah, I wanted them to live. They were neat. Um, like I, I really liked, for example, the the scene early in the game. I think it was in chapter two or three where um, Mike and Jess have snuck off to the other cabin and are trying to get romantic with each other. And um, that scene has some dialogue in it that I was like, that's actually a totally decent scene. Um, up to that point, they've seemed like you know Jess has seemed kind of like an airhead, and Mike has seemed kind of like a jock. And then they have this scene where they talk to each other and uh, they kind of explain that they're sort of performing these roles. Like Jess sort of freaks out and kind of confesses that she feels like she's faking it. And then they have this kind of nice conversation that I was like, wow, okay, these these people are talking to each other like human beings. They're not totally two dimensional. And then, of course, immediately she gets uh, she gets related by a window. (laughs) Yeah. Unless unless you're. Uh, particularly good at quick time events. Oh my god, no. that's the first death in the game, and it's the most difficult one to prevent. Like, so hard. I definitely let her die the first time I played through, and then trying it again when I was playing through a second time, it took me like two or three tries. I'm glad it's near the beginning of the episode, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to do it because I had to restart the episode several times. I was cracking up during that too because, um, you know, you're running with Mike, and if you miss the um, quick time event, he is like banging his head on the log he should have gone under or tripping on the uh over the rock or like slipping and falling and i was so bad at him this early in the game like i actually got pretty good at him by the end and saved some people but i was so bad at it it was just mike like ping-ponging his way through this forest and i was like i don't know what this is but if there's um, repercussions of me being so bad at this, I have certainly failed. And I I think I successfully did like four of the quick time events in that one. And for sure, Jessica was dead. Like I was so slow, the elevator should have fallen before I even <laughs> got like, you should have just never seen Jessica's body. Yeah, that one was really tough. But a lot of the other deaths are um also there's there's two types of deaths it seems like there's some that are like just a a simple choice you do choice a and then that person lives choice b and then that person dies like for example with ashley (laughs) pretty far towards the end of the game um you know i i thought we i thought it would be a good idea to go into the room and investigate that don't investigate the sound no don't investigate the sound you got 
So you got killed. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. And I was pretty so pissed about it because I felt like it. it oh, a murder? Wendigo leaps out and eats you. Like, like, what do you think is going to happen? But I thought, <laughs> surely there's no way that the game would just do something this obvious. Like, uh, there's got to be some reason that that there, that noise is going trap on. Door. <laughs> yeah, said. a locked yeah. trap door. <laughs> Yeah, don't do that. So uh, let's jump to the end real quick. Just uh, who did you guys, um, who were your surviving party members, if you can remember? Uh, on my first playthrough, I think that the only person that survived was Mike. Brutal. Yeah, it was pretty brutal. Even Sam died because there's that last moment where you have to like be perfectly still. And I swear I was perfectly still. But oh, that's it, funny. Yeah. It did. It still didn't work. I it did. It, it thought I had moved, and I swear I didn't. But it thought I did. My official survivors were Sam and Chris, and it's such a bummer because I actually had at the house at the end. I had Sam, Chris, Mike, and Ashley all alive, and I had survived all of the moments. Those don't you know? Don't move. All of them, and. The last decision you can make in the game, essentially, is either save Mike or rush for the switch. Mm. And I had played this game so carefully. I had, Every decision I had made, I had leaned towards go the safe route. Let's do everything safe, trying to keep people alive. For some reason, I just like gut instinct did the rush for the, um, rush for the switch. And that killed Mike and Ashley and Chris and Sam get out. And I was ah. so bummed because I had made, you know, I felt really good having had four of them still alive in the last moment and did not get out of it with them. I also, with um, Emily's, uh, I just want to bring this up real quick, with Emily's series of quick time events, oh, I looked yeah. it up. Hers is a really long series of quick time events to decide her fate. Oh, I, I made it to literally the last button press. Before me too. I, me too. Ugh. And she fell into the grinder. Yeah. Yeah. She. she she's. I remember some of the deaths. I. I, I got. I got um, Matt through, and I got Sam through, and I got. I got like random people through, like people who they clearly did not think I was going to survive did survive, but I lost like all the people who were who I think the game wanted me to have survive, like Mike. I felt like probably I should have saved Mike. Didn't manage to save Mike. I ended up with like the random supporting characters alive at the end. <laughs> yeah, that's how I was with Chris, Chris. Chris survived, but like I didn't have to do like apparently once I got through a certain amount of time with Chris, like he was not going to die. Basically, if you make it through the Wendigo chase with Chris, he's going to make it to the end. So, yeah, Chris, Matt, Sam. There's so many... um uh, so many different types of deaths. Like the Chris one, you have to be pretty good at that. Like, it's not a quick time event. It's a point and shoot kind of thing that you have to aim quickly and accurately. Um, and then, you know, Emily, it's a series of quick time events. Uh, Sam, it's that thing where you have to hold your controller perfectly still so that you don't attract attention. Um, and that also with Matt. Matt, you also don't move. Oh, yeah. Same thing. So, yeah. yeah. So I got three out, but two of them were because I didn't move. Matt got put on a meat hook. Oh, mine. how'd through that his, happen? Through his face. I had made it, um, I had also made it really far with him, and it's during the, um, when the uh, tower is collapsing, and you and, and him and Emily are about to fall into the old mine. There's another troop, trope, an mm -hmm. old mine, um, and if you choose to, you have two options. You can either try to save Emily or jump to safety. If you try to save Emily, it results in the whole thing collapsing um, and Matt falling into like a side tunnel. And there's a Wendigo right there who picks him up and puts him onto a meat hook. Uh, unless you have the, unless Matt has the, um, the flare gun. And that's one of the weirder ones. If you really want to save Matt, you have to kind of plan ahead and i mean i i don't think i would have been able to do it without looking some stuff up i i've i've managed to save him so far in the, uh, in the second did. playthrough oh you I did, did Laura. Save emily you saved matt well if you drop emily i think it's easier it probably it sounds like it's easier to save matt because you don't get a pale on a meat hook <laughs> yeah i didn't have a choice it was once uh once i had fallen i had chosen to save emily didn't by the way he fails at it they both fall but he falls into a different spot than he would have fallen 
if you had choose, chosen jump to safety. And I guess maybe if I had the flare gun, I could have shot the Wendigo or something, but I had, there was really out of my hands at that point. And no, I just hid. I yeah. mean, I hid a lot with Matt, like at the end of the game. I didn't have a flame flare, but I hid. Uh, to save Matt, you, you, he has to have an unused uh, flame, like uh, a flare gun. And I think that you're right. I think it might be different if you let Emily fall or something like that. I'm not 100% sure on that. But yeah, it, it, in or, if you're going to save everybody, you have to make sure that he has the unused flare gun. And the problem is that there's some choices you can make earlier that will cause him to use the flare gun immediately. And it's actually just a dialogue choice. I don't remember exactly what it is, but I think it's ha- I think it has to do with whether or not he wants to go with Emily to the fire tower or not, something like that. Um, but depending on how he feels... At the time, when he gets the flare gun, he might just use it immediately, which means then he doesn't have it um, uh, to to use later to, to defend himself, which I thought was like one of the harder ones to predict. Yeah, I, I didn't try to save Emily, mostly because at that point we were fighting and I was, I think that day I was like playing for maximum teen drama. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I didn't try to save her. That's a good way to go. That's a good way to go in this game. Play for maximum teen drama. <laughs> Duty survive. That's all that matters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you managed to save Duty from Greece. Um, and I'm playing through it a second time now, and it uh, looks like I might be able to save everybody, and I'm looking forward to that. Also, spare thought, we don't have to put in the podcast, but I definitely had the thought when they were moving in. I was like, where are their grocery bags? Oh, it's right. Like, <laughs> it's like, these teens are going to starve. They didn't even bring booze. They're getting there at 10. They have and no food. They have no food. Also, that guest house is like three miles up the mountain from the normal house. You spend so long walking uh, Mike and um, Jessica all the time. way up, all the way up to that house. And I know it's just for the like for the plot to develop, but, but man, I was like, this is just like different property. This isn't. In, this is someone else's house that we're walking to. So far away. So all in all, a pretty good horror story, a pretty good horror movie, really. Um, and so if that's the sort of thing that you like, I think um, you should watch or play this game. Like, I really enjoyed playing it with my wife. We we had a really great time kind of um, – we, we enjoyed it the same way that we enjoy horror movies or, or horror TV shows. Like if that's something that you enjoy or, or even if you don't enjoy horror movies and you enjoy this sort of telltale style or sort of telltale style uh, adventure game, also worth giving this a try. I would say, and I don't say this very often, but I would say maybe wait for a sale on this one. I did see that it's um, – I think there's a digital only – on PlayStation, I saw it for $30. Yes, that's yeah, how I got it. It's down and to 39 as the like yeah. MSRP for it now, so it, sales are going to go a little deeper. I, I bought this one day one and spent 60 bucks on it and feel perfectly fine about that decision because I, I enjoyed the game a lot. But um, it is a kind of a weird game in its price point. Like I really think it's a strange thing that there's a $60 uh, you know, big budget, triple A, incredibly technically well done game in this genre at all. And I, I don't think we're going to see any more like it. Like, I think this is a really weird one off thing. I don't think that, you know, Supermassive is going to turn around and make Until Dawn 2 um, and have it be the same level of budget and production quality and also this same short length and gameplay style. Like, this is a really weird game in its yeah, niche. And I don't think we really hit on hard enough that this game is really pretty and i know we said it looks good but like they definitely spent their you know the money that they had on this game was spent you know like Mm -hmm. it's a very technically sound game yeah gorgeous graphics it's a real showpiece for the playstation 4 yeah we just don't tend to get a lot of those at the short game because we tend to do a lot of really small ones and this one is luxurious (laughs) luxurious <laughs> which is weird to say about something that has so many skulls and like <laughs> and gore so I'm glad we finally got around to doing this game uh, it's a it's such a weird game 
and and so short compared to other AAA games of its sort that I really wanted to make sure that we at least covered it, even if it's not necessarily like something that everybody should necessarily play. Um, I think it's worth checking out if you like horror or any of those other things we just described. Um, uh, next week, we're going to be talking about another very short game that has an upcoming PS4 release but isn't actually out on PS4 yet, so we're going to be playing the uh, the PC version, and that's Jazz Punk from Necrophone Games. Uh, Jazz Punk is pretty weird. It's uh, it's a kind of a comedy 3D adventure game, and the, the graphics look a lot like if you've played um, 30 Flights of Loving or other sort of it's it looks like um, a bunch of very weird, blocky, non-realistic sort of representative 3D graphics, and uh, it's sort of a spoof of uh, of I guess a spy story. So I'm really looking forward to, to talking about it. I played a little bit of it at uh, uh, at PlayStation Experience uh, on the PlayStation 4. Just their their you know they had a, a demo of that there and got kind of interested in it, and I really enjoyed the game. So I'm looking forward to talking about it. Love a good spoof. As opposed to a good spook, which was this week. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Someone had to do the dad jokes, man. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I've fallen down on my dad jokes th- this week. Thank you for picking up the slack, Laura. Um, so thank you for joining us on this episode of The Short Game. I've been your host, Reagan Kelly, and you can find me on Twitter at Reagan K. That's R-A-Y-G-A-N-K. And you can find our show on the internet at www.theshortgame.net, where you'll find all of our show notes, as well as a, a feedback form where you can let us know what you think and recommend us games and generally deliver us praise. That is what we like. Um, if you uh, go on iTunes, you can also review the show, which we really appreciate. It helps people find out about us, and uh, we do read those and get a little thrill out of it every time. Um, and uh, thank you so much for joining me, Laura. How, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Laura J. Nash. And Nate, where can people find you? You can also find me on Twitter at NateSTL. And join us next week on The Short Game.